Uh, well, welcome to generating a static website with Tome. I'm Stephen Cross. A little bit about me. I have a podcast called Talking Drupal. Uh, if you've never listened to it, go check it out. Um, I also am the organizer of the New England Drupal Camp. Um, so if you want to check out New England in the fall, uh, we have the camp in Providence, Rhode Island around mid-November. So uh, our announcement for the date will be coming out soon for next year. Um, I also have a uh, blog that I blog on about things in Drupal and Linux and things like that, stephencross.com. Um, I currently am contracting with the Department of Justice. Been working on some contracts with them for the past three years and into the foreseeable future. I'm currently working on ATF.gov is one of the projects I'm working on. Um, has anyone ever been to GovCon in Washington, D.C.? It's a great conference. Um, I went there, I think, the first time maybe three years ago. And uh, a couple of years back, I went to a presentation about static site development. Um, is, I was really interested in learning about static sites what it was all about. So I went to this session and it was a really interesting Drupal camp experience because the presenter didn't show up. So we're sitting in a room with probably 30 people, something maybe like this, and there's no presenter there. So some people that attended the session said, you know, hey, let me, I can talk about five minutes about this topic. And then when that person was done, someone else got up and talked about something they knew about static site development. It turned out to be one of the best sessions I ever attended. It was really interesting, I learned a lot of things. And one of the tools mentioned that day was Tome, but it was really young, and no one in the room actually knew a whole lot about it. Um, so today, I'm gonna to fill in the gaps from that. So, what is Tome? Well, Tome is a static site generator for Drupal 8. Thank you for coming. Um, it's for developing what I would call a normal Drupal 8 site. You develop a normal site, a simple site, we'll get into what that means in a little while, and you push a button and export it to HTML. That's what Tome does. Why do we care about that? Let's start there. Well, we care about that because hosting a Drupal website is hard. Building a website is not so hard a simple website, in my opinion. Uh, I do think that hosting a site is really hard. Why is that? Because there's a minimum cost to hosting a Drupal website. And what I mean by a minimal cost is, whether the website is 15 pages, 3,000 pages, or 100,000 pages, there's things that you have to care about and pay attention to and worry about. Things like performance, things like security. It costs a lot of money. A lot is a relative term, but there's a minimum cost and there's a minimum effort. And that's for every single Drupal site that you put out on the internet that's live. Performance is something that we care about. Um, and it has gotten easier in some ways in Drupal 8 and gotten harder in some ways in Drupal 8, depending on the size site you have. We have Drupal 8 caching that comes out of the box for internal, internal page caching and dynamic caching. Then we stick varnish on the servers to speed things up. Then we have edge servers sticking out there to get as close as we can to the user and deliver to those anonymous users the pages as fast as we can. And the whole goal of all those caching mechanisms is to do what? It's to give the user HTML. That's what our goal is, is to generate HTML have the final rendered thing that they're going to get and have it as close as we can to them. Then we've got the other issues of security, which is the, probably the biggest concern for a lot of us. 
and that we have lots of vulnerabilities at all kinds of levels in hosting. We have PHP vulnerabilities. We have server OS vulnerabilities. We have JavaScript vulnerabilities. The list goes on and on of things that can go wrong and people that are trying to get to that database that we're hosting and get to the server that we're hosting so they can mess with it. So have you ever, let me ask this question, have you ever put a simple website, you know, you know Drupal, you're comfortable with it, you know you can pump out a website pretty quickly, you put a simple website out, you launch it on some hosting platform, and then you forgot about it. You didn't pay attention to it for all kinds of reasons. You just left it there for a while, and then all of a sudden, something like Drupal Geddon happens, where there's a vulnerability that came out, it impacted the site. Now this little site that you've ignored for two or three years turns into this giant headache for you. Because now you've got to move a site, you've got a pro you probably have a compromised server, a compromised database, you've got lots of problems. That's the minimal cost, the effort that it takes to host a Drupal website. And how many times have you had this happen to you where you say to yourself, oh, I could do that so easily in Drupal, but it's not worth it. Because of that cost I talked about. You can build the site, you can put the content in, you can give it to someone, but you know it's going to be one of those sites that you're not going to be able to pay attention to, so you just kind of walk away from it. Because it's not worth that effort, that ongoing effort that you have. It's too much work to maintain. As small as that site is, 15 pages, 5 pages, 100 pages, it's too much work moving forward. So what if, I ask you what if, what if you could lower that cost to host a Drupal site? That cost we've been talking about, of the performance and the security and all that effort you have to put into it. What if you could actually build a site and forget it? What if you could do all the things, you could use all the things in Drupal that you love, right? You could use your favorites, Theme. You could use your favorite modules. You could build the site and maintain it, maintain the content like you would in the admin tool. And what if you could launch it and forget it? That would be like heaven, right? Like, oh, the perfect environment. That's what we're talking about today. That's a little dramatic, I get it. But that's where I think this module, this really simple, straightforward module, that does some pretty amazing things, can play a role in your work here. So, Tome, to refresh your memory again, is a static site generator. And it comes with two modules. We're gonna talk about those independently. The first one is the key thing of what Tome is all about. Is It's a module called Tome Static. And it literally generates a static HTML site from your Drupal site. So you would build the site the way you do today, and then you would export all of that site to a folder on your computer, basically, slash HTML, and it's sitting there. So you can open it up in your browser on your computer with no web server and see the website running in its entirety. Does that sound like something you're interested in? So what do you do with it after that, though? Right? So you've got a static site. Well, you can do whatever you want with it. At that point, you can set up a hosting server, a $5 a month on DigitalOcean, and rsync the HTML code somewhere. At this point, you have a folder with HTML, so you can use whatever method you want to get that website out to a live environment. There are some additional modules that can help you with that, with tools like, with services like Netlify. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. So there's two kinds of ways, I think, that you can be successful using Tome. So one is um, you separate your site and your content building from where your production hosting actually is. 
So if you're in a scenario where you have like a one user site, let's say it's your Aunt Millie, she has, she sells antiques and she wants to put an antique blog up. Well, what you can do is you can set up a Drupal site, put it maybe on her local machine. She runs the site, starts it up on her machine, does the content editing, um, uh, then pushes a button. You've built a script that pushes it out to the production server. So that's like a one user scenario. You also have a multi-user scenario. So nothing has changed in that scenario for Drupal. You stick it out on a shared server. You could potentially get like a Pantheon developer site, give people access to it, and they maintain the content there. Then you still go through the process at the end of pushing a button, generates the static HTML, and you stick it somewhere else. You don't need to be on Pantheon anymore necessarily. You don't need all of that stuff necessarily for this site. It depends on what your needs are. So a static site in Drupal does have some limitations. So let's touch on a few of those to get started here. Um, I did this, so the first, I think the site that I'm gonna show you in a few minutes here, I think I put it together in a couple of weekends or a weekend. Um, and I, I literally set it up, put some blog posts in it uh, maybe a year ago, and I have forgotten about it. It's just kind of sat there. And this is, I think, the third time I've done this presentation. I kind of log into it the night before, make sure that the connections are still working. But that HTML site has been sitting out there for a while. Uh, and there are some issues that you have if you're dealing with just HTML. There are limitations, right? HTML can only take you so far. So these are some of the things you need to think about. Or, or things you'll run into if you're going down this route. So any dynamic calls or interactions that you have in a website that call back to Drupal to do something, in an HTML site, it doesn't exist anymore, right? So an example of that would be a form. So if you build a Drupal form with web form or whatever, and you're saving stuff to the database, that database doesn't exist now. So you have to find a way to deal with forms. Comments. Comments is an interaction back to the Drupal site to interact with the database and save comments. Those aren't gonna work with just plain HTML anymore. Views are an interesting one. Um, and that if you build a view, a view would work just fine. Uh, the, the place that you have trouble is exposed filters. So if you have a view with an exposed filter, so you wanna put a drop down with a taxonomy and the user changes the taxonomy and interacts. I don't know where that noise is coming from. Hi. Welcome down. See if I can help. Okay. I'm not touching anything, so. <laughs> um, so views, exposed filters, interaction with the database, it's an issue. There are some strategies to deal with that. And then obviously Drupal search. So let's talk about some of the solutions to those general problems. Well, if we're dealing with HTML, you really need to look for some front-end solutions to these problems, the JavaScript solutions and third-party solutions. Maybe just turn it off, right? It is off. Yeah, okay. Thanks. So, for example, you could use um, JavaScript and third-party libraries to handle some of the things like comments. So you could integrate Discuss, third-party JavaScript tool, you kind of put the plugin into the HTML, it works. That's a way to handle comments. Forms, if you're using a hosting provider like Netlify, they actually have, that, that's a, a hosting provider that specializes in static HTML sites and they have like a service that you can add forms in using their service and you can put them right on your page and then someone fills out a form, you get an email with the data. That's the way you'd handle something like that. Um, searching, so searching is another thing you can handle with JavaScript. There's a tool called Lunar that is a JavaScript based search. I'll show this to you in a few minutes. It's a way that basically um, you have JavaScript on the front end, it's looking at some JSON files of your content and does it in the, in the front end, returns the search results to you. 
So those are the kinds of things you need to look at if you're going to go down this route of a static website. So where, how far can you go with this? What, what are the kinds of things you can do? Where does it fit? So I think it fits, this approach fits in things like a simple blog. Um, it fits in things like maybe a marketing site that's going to be up temporarily that you're kind of going to design it once and build it once and just stick it somewhere and maybe pull it down six months later. It's with those sites that don't have a lot of dynamic interaction, but they need to be online and they need to be fast and they need, need to be easy to maintain. So this is an example of the site that I put together. Um, if you go to switchingtolinux.com, you can actually see this running. You'll see that it's super fast because it's just HTML. Um, and you can see that I really used my design skills to put a real nice design together. Obviously, that's the Bartik theme, but I went with gray, not blue, uh, to make it look slightly different. Um, but this is really just a simple blog site. And I really didn't have to do a whole lot to get this thing to work. So, for example, um, let me, paging in views automatically just works. So if I was to navigate through this site, you see here that I'm on page one, and then I've got more content on page two, by default, when you have a view, the way the tone module works, it actually goes through all your paths that are in your database, and it builds all the URLs so you can go from page one to page two without any trouble. And it does it by, you know, you look at the path at the, the URL at the top of the page, you'll see the full path out with the page numbers written in. So something like that seems like it's dynamic when someone's hitting next page, and next page, and next page. It's not really. These pages have already been pre-built. You can see a shot right there of the URL showing page two. Um, this is an example of the comments. So I integrated Discuss in this, and I did it on the Drupal side. I just installed the Discuss module, configured it like I would if I was putting it on a regular Drupal site, and the export just worked because it's just using JavaScript. What does it cost for Discuss? What's that? Does Discuss cost you money? Uh, Discuss is free. It costs... Um, it's a free service, so free. I was going to make a snarky comment about maybe it, uh, it costs the user giving up some of their privacy, yeah. but I decided, not to go down, <laughs> I decided not to go down that road. Um, this here is a screenshot of the search page. Um, I do have an internet connection, so when I'm done with the presentation, I'll go back and show this to you interactively. Uh, but you basically put a search term in, um, hit search, and it, it's not super fast, but it brings the results back to the page. For a small site, it works the way I think it should, or, or is what I consider good enough. Um, one thing that I mentioned earlier with views is that you can't do contextual filters. But the way Drupal works with taxonomies, taxonomy pages are out of the box already paths that when you click on them, they'll, they'll show you all of the content related to it. So you can get this dynamic feel, like on the right side of this page here, you'll see that I have the article sorted by taxonomies that I built. And really when the user clicks on that, all it's doing is going to the taxonomy page that Drupal had already generated and that tone generated when it generated the static HTML. So there is this feeling on the user's side that it's kind of like a dynamic experience when it's really not. With a little bit of effort, you could probably turn these into drop downs pretty easily and still have it go to static pages. <coughs> I didn't take that route. So, to recap on that first module, the Tome static module, it basically, you build a Drupal site, you use Tome to generate this HTML that goes out to a folder on your computer. And there's a drush command to actually generate, you know, you need to do it through the UI. Is it me getting close? Maybe. Maybe that's it. So 
you stay away from it. It did stop when you walked away, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, it's a drush command. So like that's a drush command that I would use to generate this website. Drush, home static, and a URL that it's gonna be sticking and replacing in the code. And it takes care of all that stuff for you. If there's images, it figures out the images, figures out the paths to them, includes them in the HTML and an images folder. So that's the first piece of Tome. There's a second piece that's kind of unrelated to generating the static site, but is just as an interesting module. And this is called Tome Sync. So you install Tome, you get these two modules, Sync and Static. Sync does something really interesting. It's a way of managing your content and configuration through JSON files. So what happens is when you install this module and you add a new node to your database, it when you hit save, it's hooked into that and it's writing out that content in a JSON file. So all of your content actually turns into JSON files, which you can now manage through Git or some other mechanism to manage your content and store it. You can check it into the database. Let me let that sink in for a second. You check your content in to your repo. So I install Tome Sync. I go add this content. As I'm adding content, it's building these JSON files, I then say, okay, I'm gonna create a commit, push it up to the database. Uh, I see it said database, but push it up to the repo. I now have a repo on GitHub that has my code for Drupal, my configuration for my um, content types and my taxonomies, and it has the data. So I can actually, at this point, delete the entire system from my computer. I could clone the repo and rebuild the entire system back up. So here's a, just a quick example of that. So this is me doing a git status. I've got a clean branch. I go and create an article. I hit save. And then I do a git status. And I see that two JSON files have been updated. So why would you use this? Well, there's a couple of ways you can use this. So you don't need to use this at all to have anything to do with the static stuff we talked about earlier. But what it does do is it gives you a mechanism now to think about your system can really just be code in a repository. And when I said that you can literally you know, build something and forget about it, you can build it, launch it, and delete it as long as you've checked it in somewhere. And then six months later, if you have to make a change to it, you know, you're, you're three computers down the road, you're on someone else's machine, you just clone that thing, refresh it on that machine, you're back up and running in the maintenance mode of it. You could also use this tool, if you think about it, for a CI process. That you could build a CI process now that doesn't only just like build your artifacts and like install Drupal, but it could actually like populate the database from the repository. It's very straightforward. Once you install that module, you get a couple of drush commands. It's like drush tome sync import and export. And it works. It's really fascinating. There's probably more things you can do with this. Like if you're, if you're doing um, JavaScript front end tools, this could be a way for you to do a, a migration. You could install this module on a Drupal 8 site. You could export all of the content into JSON files and use them for something with some other front end tools. Just a really interesting thing that I think would be um, helpful you to know about. A couple of other modules that I found useful in that little project, switching to, to Linux that I did. Um, one of them is another module that uh, is available from the maintainer of Tome, who's Samuel Mortensen. 
um, is Tome Netlify. So Netlify I mentioned a couple of times as a service that you can host a website on. They actually have a free, a free level for you, which is what I'm using for this sample site. And the module that comes that you can install in Drupal allows you to connect your account with Netlify. So when you do the export of HTML, you can then just push a button and it will rsync the files from your local machine or wherever you built the site up to Netlify. It's done some key sharing, knows about who you are. It's an easy way to get your static HTML up to the Netlify account. You could also set up Netlify using its CI processes to basically pull your repo down and build your site that way as well. But this, uh, this Tome Netlify module is, is handy when you're trying to experiment with this and get something live. That's, uh, this is, I've got the switch slides there, so that's the Tome Netlify. So it's really a simple sort of, there's a GUI interface and there's a Drush command interface for it. When you're ready to push your code out, you just push a deploy button, it creates a branch out on Netlify, and then you jump over to Netlify, and you basically push it out to the internet. What prevents the module yep. from being published? What prevents what? The module itself. Though, if you go back one page, uh, the, um, the deployment module. So. So this, this is the Netlify module sitting on wherever I've got the active Drupal site. Right. All of this module does is takes the HTML that I've exported on that machine, connects to Netlify and pushes the HTML out there. It Why doesn't, it, it yeah, it, it doesn't, it's only pushing the HTML folder. It's not pushing anything related to my Drupal site. So I already mentioned uh, this before, Lunar is this uh, Java-based uh, tool for um, creating searches. It's think, you can think of it sort of like Search API. Um, I think this was also written by, um, by the maintainer of Tome as well, this, this interface. So in summary, Tome is a great module um, to utilize your existing Drupal skills, you know, take everything you love about Drupal and then get rid of the stuff that you hate about Drupal in terms of the hosting side. And for the right site, small site, marketing pages, things like that, this is really a good tool to have in your toolbox. It's not for everything, it's, but it is for that thing where you can launch and forget about it. And for people who are into headless Drupal and going down that road, that sync module could be something that could play a role in your toolbox as well in the future. So, that's all I have to say about Tome. I'm gonna sh I'll show you something in a minute, we have a few extra minutes, but there's one more thing I wanted to bring up today. Completely unrelated topic. I'm just gonna take advantage because I have a few extra minutes. Um, I'm a big Linux fan for the desktop. So I'm just curious, how many people are using Macs as their primary development tool? Desktop tool, Macs? No, how about Windows? Any Linux people? All right, we've got uh -oh. two in the room. Okay, um, so I switched to Linux about two years ago now. I was 15 year fanboy of Apple, Apple everything. Apple all the time, and then I won't go to a long, uh, a long presentation here is why I switched and stuff. You can go to stephencross.com and see some other presentations I've done about that. But I think it's real important that Drupal developers, I think they're way better in a Linux desktop environment. And the reasons for that are many, but I think one of the ones I just want to bring up today, and if you've not thought about it in the past, I think you should consider looking in that direction, and I know it could be scary, but Drupal development with Docker, which is what most of us are using today, some sort of Docker solution, whether it be Lando or DDEV or something, runs so much faster on a Linux machine, it's shocking. Um, and if you've never experienced this, and I know a couple of you have, um, this really became apparent to me like two weeks ago, and I'm working with some colleagues 
um, in DOJ, and they're mostly on Macs and I'm on Linux. And we were working, sharing our screens together, doing some builds. What was taking second, literally seconds on my machine was taking minutes on their machines. And it was very straightforward. So I did some research and took some, took some uh, time snaps here. So all I was doing, all we were doing is was a simple build of an artifact. So it was going and generating the artifacts for the website. I was running on this particular Linux computer that I have here. It was taking less than 20 seconds to do that on my machine. On the Mac, that my colleague was running, it was taking almost 10 minutes to do the exact same thing. And I started to think, oh, there's something wrong here. There's something wrong. We started to dig into it and realize that it's, there's nothing wrong here. It's just that Mac OS and Docker don't get along well. There's too many communication layers for those two environments. So we ended up doing some testing. So these are real results. I took, a, uh, this, I took uh, two Linux machines ran the same process, this is not very scientific by the way, um, a i5 with two cores and almost 10 year old ThinkPad ran this build process in 20 seconds. My high end sort of Linux machine that I built with an i7, eight cores, did it in seven seconds. The same similar hardware specs on the Mac, the i5, two cores, took almost the 10 minutes. I had eight plus there. I was trying to be a little conservative. And then a newer i7 Mac took six minutes. So if anyone, so I, I like to joke around with people all the time. Just, if you want your Mac, take it to the coffee shop and stuff, but you should just get your 10-year-old ThinkPad and do your real work on it because it's a lot faster. So I just want to bring this up. Um, if anyone wanted to talk to me about switching to Linux, I have a presentation that I've done a few times, why I switched, how you could switch, etc. Um, so I just want to bring that up today because I have some time. And I will take questions, and I could also like show you the site and do a build if we wanted to. Is there any questions? I mean, I just want to say that it's almost trivial to set up a dual boot system on any Mac. It's true. Yep, that's a good point. If you had, so his point was you can bring a do a dual boot system on a Mac. I think you had trouble. Correct me if I'm wrong with Macs that are newer with that, right? Uh, I don't know where how it works with T2. I, I haven't tried that yet. Right. Yeah. I think I think there's trouble with the new the new the new chip with that. But yeah. Any uh, tricks on an email interface like contact of one? Yeah. So um, that like. To be the thing. Yeah, so like what I did for the sample I did, I just put a, uh, you know, a mail to link. Um, if you're going to do forms, so you're talking about mail to, you can do a mail to link, which is just HTML, or you have to use a form service, like from Netlify, use a third party uh, form service. And there are other party, there are other third party systems that you can build forms in HTML and then use their service to, to handle the emails. Are they cheap? Uh, you know, if you're talking price, that's what yeah, so like Netlify, I, I assume it's free. I don't know. I, I assume there's, I assume if you're doing thousands of emails, there's issues there and there's, yeah. there's cost associated with it. Yep. It's like all nonprofit sites. Yeah. That's a good question. I'm not sure. I assume there's some cost associated with doing it that way. I don't know what it is. Yeah. Any thoughts on the boost module? It also makes static pages. The which module? Boost module. Boost? I'm not familiar with it. Does it do the same sort of thing? It, it, this does a lot more, but uh, it's, yeah. it's sort of an older approach. Yeah. I wasn't, when I first ran this, I was impressed because um, if you think about the complexity that it takes to do what it's doing, it's pretty complex. Because um, it's going through all the paths of your site and figuring it out. And it's not just like going through a single path table if you think about it. You have page, some pages that are built with view pages. Those aren't like really paths, right? And Tome has figured out how to deal with all that stuff. And when you're like doing media embeds, so you have like sort of media tags inside the HTML, it has figured out how to deal with all that stuff too. So it's, there's probably, I found a couple of bugs. Um, an example of a bug that I found when I did this, I used the fonts, uh, what's the module font something where you can pick uh, web fonts and put them in font? Uh, 
Font what? Awesome. Font awesome. It's not font awesome, but it's one of those modules. When you install that module, if you want to use web fonts, it actually goes and builds taxonomies for all the different fonts. So my, my example site had basically 10 nodes in it. I installed that font module and I ended up with, with pads that were like 4,500 because of the fonts that I chose. So there's a small issue there where Netlef um, Tome was going through the taxonomies. It didn't, doesn't know that that taxonomy was built by a module and I'm not really using it. And it went and built paths for all that. So I ended up just going through and I used a different module to go in. I used rabbit hole to say any of these paths. Ignore them, those aren't real paths and that fixed the problem. So there's, I think there's little things that you will find if you take Tome and try to take it like pretty far down the road, you probably run into issues. But what I've seen is the module maintainer is ex extremely accessible <coughs> on uh, Slack. There's a Slack channel on Drupal for his uh, module that he's been very responsive there and through email. So any of the issues I've had has been very quick in terms of responding to. Any other questions? Well, thank you for attending. <laughs> <laughs>